I want to begin by saying, I have an email that I want to read. And um, I asked for permission to read it, so I'm not putting anybody on blast. And I'm going to leave the name out so you all don't know what it is. But the reason I asked to read this email um, is I think it's reflective of where a lot of us are, sometimes myself included, in the body of Christ. And so there's a lot of truth in here. And it's birthed out of our Wednesday night Bible study. This Wednesday we were talking and we um, used extensively the illustration of the miracle at my mile high. Um, Y'all don't know what that is? Really? Y'all forgot what the miracle at mile high... Y'all wasn't watching TV Sunday night? Yeah, the game, the game, come on. Yeah. Yeah, that was a miracle, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I'm praying for one of those to happen in Dallas, you see? That's... Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Y'all get it now, yeah. The miracle at mile high, amen, that's what it is. But, but out of that, we were talking, and it was a, a very lively conversation and discussion as we kind of talked about a couple of things. And here's what this person wrote me. Uh, it says, Pastor Gilbert, thank you for your obedience and delivery of God's word. Last night, we used the analogy of the football field to describe the battlefield for doing God's work. You asked the question about why certain people themselves, as spectators, at our see themselves as spectators and not as players. The question made me think about my own position on the team and led me to the honest revelation. I have not spent enough time on the practice field preparing for the game. Therefore, I lack the confidence to raise my hand and say, put me in coach. Um, As discussed last night, the game of football is a contact sport and have led to a lot of injuries and in some small cases, even death. As you are aware, there are numerous stories here and abroad where Christians are being tortured, raped, and murdered for their faith. Some believe that a Christian holocaust is occurring and some and more Christians are being killed today across the world for their faith than any other time in history. Whether this argument is true or not, I recognize that the battle requires a ride or die kind of faith. The Apostle John was the only disciple who died of natural causes And there were nearly 60 disciples who turned back and no longer followed Jesus. And there's a reference, John 6 and 66. I also think about the moment of time Jesus spent preparing for his purpose. From the age of 12 to 30, and even when his mother attempted to put him in the game after the wine ran out, (laughs) he told her, woman, why do you involve me? My hour has not yet come. Another reference, John 2 and 4. I do not want to say put me in coach and then be a fair weather player a person who supports only when it is easy and convenient to do so. I want to remain on the field after the weather changes during the season from 80 degrees in September to blizzard conditions in December, the miracle at mile high. Yeah. I don't want to say put me in coach and then turn away because it is likely that I will be injured or killed because the team we are playing is trying to brutally destroy us. I am wrestling with a spirit of fear and or lack of faith. Possibly for this reason, I think about what God told me to do some time ago, and that was to prepare. I don't know what for, I don't know why. However, I believe that this means I need more time on the practice field. Please pray that I continue to grow in spiritual knowledge, wisdom, and strength while dying in the flesh so I can get in the game and serve God's purpose for my life. Isn't that something? Then it says, I continue to pray for your leadership. Let the message of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom through psalms, hymns, um, from the spirits, singing to God with gratitude and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him, Colossians 3. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, Yeah, that's awesome. Man, come on. That's that's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. The reason I asked for permission to read that, that letter is because um, I want to have a locker room talk this morning, okay? Um, and yet to be in here Wednesday to kind of get it. I want to prepare you for the game even more before we go in the game. We've been dealing with the book of Colossians, and a lot has been said about Colossians. Um, we spent a lot of time in chapter 1. Um, we're going into chapter 2, and I'm going to read some things from verses 6 to 15 of chapter 2. Then we're going to go into our communion service. So be, please be patient with us. But number one, we knew that Christ is supreme over the cosmic realm. 
We know that he's supreme over the earth realm and that he reconciled us to relationship with him. Now, here's the thing that he, the thing that empowers him to be able to do all that is that in Christ is the fullness of God dwelling in bodily form. So when you see Jesus, you see God. Come on, say amen. Are you with me? When you see Jesus, you see God. Very, very important that we understand that to move into. So Paul now begins to talk to the Colossians a little more in depth about the heresy that's been going on in the church at Colossae or in Colossae itself and how they ought to combat it, how they ought to prepare themselves to be all that God would have them to be so they won't succumb or give in to the wiles of the enemy. So go with me to the book of Colossians um, chapter 2. And I want to begin there. Colossians chapter 2 and jump down to verse 6. And if you guys are able to just change, put the next slide up and we're just going to walk. I just want to get to um, as much as I want to go. So here's what I want you all to understand with me this morning. We are victorious in Christ. Okay? Now, we're getting ready to go play. All right, guys? The team... Wants to kill you. You guys? I mean, yeah, they, they want to kill you. They want to they wanna take you out, okay? Um, I hope you don't have no Raiders fans in here. Um, but it's like you're getting ready to play the Raiders, man. They're they not going to break all rules. They're going to violate everything. They're going to cheat. They're going to steal. I mean, that, we're talking Oakland, guys, okay? So forgive me, Raiders fans. All right, good. I just need to say that. The enemy is coming at you with everything. Okay, listen to me carefully. I'm standing before you guaranteeing you a victory. Y'all, come on, y'all, y'all. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I need, I need, I need y'all to get this going in. You've already won. Okay? You've already won. So it doesn't matter what play the offensive or the defensive coach calls. It doesn't matter what play they throw against you. They might knock you down. You might have to go on a six-week sabbatical because you got a broken clavicle or ankle or something. Fact of the matter is, at the end of the game, when you look at the scoreboard, you've won. So come on, say, I am victorious. Say it again. Say, I am victorious in Christ. Say it again. Say, I am victorious in Christ. Now, I need about two or three people just to let out a shout to let me know that you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah, amen. Just pretend we're in overtime and, you know, they had the ball and they messed up and you get it. You're about to run that. <laughs> and we're about to score a touchdown, all right? I'm telling you how the game is going to end. We've already won. So we are fighting and playing from a position of victory. Everybody all right? Okay, go to the next slide. I want to walk through this. Then we're going to read scripture in a little while. Keep, keep going because I want to put all three on the board. Next one. Next one. Okay, stop right there. Um, I want you to see real quick, number one, that here's what you need to do. Stay in the gym. Repeat after me. Say, stay in the gym. Yeah, stay in the gym. Yeah, yeah. I've been, I've been trying to, to look like Reuben, and so I've been doing some push-ups. And um, my wife keeps saying, stay in the gym. Yeah. yeah. I would show you all something, but no, no. no. <laughs> I know, I know. So, so I'm up to 40 now. I mean, I can do like, I'm bragging, excuse me, flesh, okay? I can do like 120 a day now. Really, I can. But ain't nothing popping out, so I don't get it. <laughs> so I need to stay in the gym. You gotta get, you, I'm going to hang in there, Ruben. I'll get there, okay? But, but the point, here's the thing. Stay in the gym. And here's what I want to say. As believers, you're called to remain faithful to Christ I want, and, and the gospel you have received. Very, very important. Stay in the gym. That means stay faithful to Christ and the gospel you have received. If we're going to talk about winning and fighting from a position of victory. Let's read the text. And I'm going to move fast because I just want to explain some things to you. Look at verse 6 of Colossians chapter 2. Say amen if you're there. Now watch this. Therefore, Paul says to the church at Colossae, as you have received Christ Jesus the Lord, he said, so walk in him. Um, some of your translations may say, so live in him. So play the game, however you want to define it. And notice these words that he uses. Rooted and built up in him 
Establish in the faith as you were taught, abounding what? In thanksgiving, okay? Now, just track with me the outline on the screen. Number one, say, I must be rooted. I must be built up. And I must be established in the faith. Now, let me say something real quick about that word rooted, then we're going to move into it. Okay, that word rooted is written in what Greek grammaticians call the perfect tense. Let me tell you what that means. It's something that happened in the past, but it has ongoing effect. Okay, now let me tell you why that is important. Because if you came to Christ, there is nothing the enemy can do to uproot you. I wish I had. Oh, y'all, y'all, y'all need to, yeah. We're fighting from a position of victory. So the perfect ten says, if you got saved yesterday and you stay there and you stay focused, you are rooted. It has ongoing, lasting effect. You're in the ground, you're in the garden, you're in the family of God, and the enemy can't pull you up, okay? Now, here's the problem, here's the problem. Here's the reason for these temple terms. Even though you are rooted, you've got to put plant food and you need to water, come on, you need to water the plant. You need to, come on, you need so the roots can stay strong. By virtue of the fact that you're rooted doesn't mean that you're all right because the enemy's still going to come. I wish I had somebody in here. So every now and then the text says you've got to be built up. So spend some time in the Word. Come on, come on, talk to me this morning. And and listen to the words that I'm going to use. Be filled constantly with the Spirit of God. Be filled constantly constantly with the presence of God. Be filled, come on, day in and day out with the presence of God so the roots can be strong. So listen how David said, so you can be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth good fruit. When? Yeah, y'all know it, y'all know it, y'all know it, y'all know it. Being rooted, okay, built up, established in the faith. And there's one more. Come on, keep going to the next slide real quick. And then we should all live our lives given one. Here's what we do. Listen to me carefully. Something goes wrong in your life and you lose hope. And we start giving credence to the owner or the coach of the team we've already defeated. I'm a Dallas fan. Dallas going to win the Super Bowl. That's rooted. (laughs) That's built up. That's established in my faith. And that's thanking God for what's going on. Are you with me? Because, because, now I didn't tell you when they're going to win the Super Bowl. Come on, y'all. Are you with me? Because I'm not giving up on my broken quarterback because he's going to come back. The problem with a lot of us in our Christian journey is we get injured and we act as if we're out. Oh, I wish I had somebody. Yeah, yeah. You, you need to see yourself coming back. Come on, are you with me? Because you've been rooted, you've been built up, and you've been established in the faith. So here's the thing. Whenever the enemy sucker puts you, you ought to learn to give God thanks in the midst of, I wish I had somebody in here, in the midst of the low men, you ought to still thank him. You know, I was processing this this morning in my Starbucks moment, and I reflected on Job. There's nobody in here that went through anything that was worse than what Job went through. Now, here's what strikes me about Job. In Job's lowest moment, he still gave thanks to God. I wish I had somebody. In Job's worst nightmare, never once did you hear Job saying that the enemy has got me because he knew who was in control. Bible puts it this way in James, count it all joy. Brothers and sisters, when you encounter trials of any kind, because the testing of your faith develops patience. Patience patience has its good work, so you can develop perseverance. Are you getting me? If you get sucker punch, you go back in the gym, learn how to block. But if you sit there and say, the devil got me, y'all pray for me. No, no, no. Build yourself up. Come on, come on. Learn how to encourage yourself in the Lord because we are fighting from a position of victory. Say it again. Say, I'm fighting from a position of victory. So look at this. 
Be rooted. Your root is there. If you know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, God's got you. And I'm moving fast because I want to get somewhere real quick with this. The next thing, know that you have an obligation to build yourself up, to build yourself up. In other words, as you put yourself in the Word of God, the presence of God takes over your life. The Spirit of God emanates from your life. And, 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 and everything about you is a reflection of who God would have you to be. Does this make sense? And then over time, here's how I said it last year, you develop maturity and, I mean yesterday, last week, you develop maturity and stability. Maturity and stability. Maturity and stability. Come on, I want you all to hear me say this. Maturity and stability. Because the stronger and the more mature you get in Christ, the less the enemy thinks he can have access to you and the more stable you are. As I grow in Christ, I mature. And I become stable, and I give, I always give thanks to God because it could be God is working something out in me. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. Quit pointing the other direction. God might be working something out in me. Are you with me? Put the next one up, and I'm going to move because I want to land somewhere really quick. Okay, keep going. Keep going. Uh, next one real quick. I think there's one more. Okay, good. Stop there. Okay, so here's the thing. This is very important. I can't get deep into this because I want to do something. I just, I'm going to say this. Rather than following human traditions, as believers, we must place our trust in Christ, in whom the fullness of the deity dwells. And listen to these three things, okay? Be aware of vain philosophies and empty deceit based on human traditions. I'm going to talk about that. Beware of elementary spirits, and we need to put our faith and trust in Christ. Very, very important statement in who the fullness of God dwells. Let me read and let me say this, and I'm hoping not to mess you up. Verse 8. See to it that no one takes you, what's the word? Captive or prisoner by philosophy or empty what? According to what? Human traditions, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to what? Verse 9. For in him, the whole fullness of deity or God dwells bodily, and you have been filled, the text says, in him, who is the head of all rule and all authority. Go back to verse 8, because verse 8 is messing with me, and I need to say this, and I'm going to get in trouble for saying it, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I think it's in the text. See to it... That no one tells you to take a handkerchief and go to the car dealership and believe God for a car. <laughs> See to it that no one tells you, golly, I, let me just go ahead and say this, that, that if you... <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble because y'all see this stuff all the time on TV and y'all believe it, you know. But, but God's word calls it vain philosophy, okay. I'm believing God for a blessing. What happens if he doesn't do it? Is it about the blessing or is it about God? I'm believing God for this. I'm believing God for that. Is it about what God can do or is it about God? Come on, I want y'all to hear me real quick. Okay, look at the text, look at vain philosophy, and what's the word? Empty deceit. I mean, we've got a whole lot of teaching that's permeating Christianity or permeating the world um, that's talking about this whole thing called the prosperity doctrine, faith movement. Oh, I want you all to hear me carefully because I want I to I hit this theologically and I want us to deal with this because a lot of us have emotional ups and downs with God because if God doesn't do what I put an obligation on him to do, then I get mad with him. People have said this before, and I'm going to say it again. If you can cause God to, you can mandate God to do what you want done, then he's not God. All of a sudden, you've become God. I want you all to hear me very, very carefully. So the text says, here's what the text says. Be careful, Colossian church, about vain philosophies and empty deceit that has nothing to do with Christ. Okay? You guys have heard me say this a million times, and I'm going to say it right now, then I'm going to go to a passage, well, I'm going to refer you to a passage of Scripture to read in a little while. 
Um, God did not leave his home in glory and incarnate himself into flesh and travel the cosmic constellation, you know, came to the earth, was born in a stable, died in a manger, grew up to live a sinless life, went through all the persecution that he did on the cross, and we're going to talk about that cross for a little while, so you can have a nice job, a nice home, a nice car, a nice wife, a lot of money in the bank. He didn't go to Calvary for that. I want you all to hear me. You can get that without him going to Calvary. Just get a good job. I keep saying that. Get a good education, you know, win the lottery, do whatever you want to do. And you can get those things. It's not about those things. Those are vain philosophies. And here, here's what I'm saying. And, and so at, at Colossae, Colossae, there was a lot of teaching going around about getting stuff from God and, and worshiping angels and worshiping this kinds of stuff to get all those things. And Paul is trying to come against that and say, it's about God. Now, let me, let me correct this something I, I want you all not to leave here saying. There's nothing wrong with having a nice home and a nice car and a nice job. Come on, there's nothing wrong with having nice things, but I don't pursue God to get those things. I pursue God to get God. Are you with me? Now, if God so chooses to bless me, that's his prerogative, and I don't hold him obligated to get those things because here's what will happen. If he stops giving me the thing, I'm going to say to him, what's wrong with you? Now listen to this, and then I'm going to move on. When you get a chance, go read the book of Ecclesiastes, written by the richest man. You think Donald Trump's got some stuff? He ain't had nothing on Solomon. Yeah, come on now. At best, he might have two or three women going, Solomon had a whole... Let me leave that alone. All right. <laughs> so, and, and, and talk about palaces and talk about money. So here's how Solomon said it. If you read the book of Ecclesiastes, when it comes to having stuff, and I'm paraphrasing, nobody on the face of the earth had more money than I did. Nobody on the face of the earth had more houses than I did. Nobody on the faces of the earth had more women and luxury than I did. But now that I've come to the end of my life and I look back at all the stuff that I had, here's what he says, all of that is vanity. It is nothing, it accounts for nothing, and it means nothing. Are you with me? So here's how he said, just be happy with what you have and put God at the center of your life and then everything's going to be okay. Quit pursuing vain philosophy. I want y'all to hear me because heaven and earth going to pass away, but God's word is not going to pass away. Quit pursuing stuff. Start looking after God. I want y'all to hear me carefully because here, here, here's what Paul is saying. Here's what Paul is Calvary is not about stuff. Calvary is not about stuff. Calvary is not about stuff. It's about God incarnate in himself and placing himself in us. We're going to talk about that. It's about God winning the game for us. <sighs> If you're worshiping God for what he can do, you might as well give up right now because you can get your feelings hurt. I'll talk a little bit about that this afternoon too, but worship God for who he is. Are you with me? I, I, I want to move because I want to I land somewhere with this. Look at the text. Look at the text. Okay, so that's how I want to summarize that. Let's go to the last one real quick, and let me read, and then I'm going to just say a couple of words. Verse 11. Thank you. Good. They learned fast in there. Verse 11. Now, carefully, let's read, because, um, let's read. Let me try to see how I can do this. In him, come on, say in Christ. In Christ. One more time, say in Christ. in Christ. You were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of who? Christ. That's a deep statement right there, very, very deep statement. I'll explain it. Okay, then it says, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. Verse 13, and you, speaking about me, who were or was dead in your trespass and uncircumcision of the flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all of our trespass. By canceling the record of debt, Lord have mercy, that stood against us with his legal demands, this he set aside, look at the next phrase, ESV, nailing it to the cross. 
And look at, I mean, oh, geez. verse 15. He disarmed the rulers and authorities, and he put them to open shame. And look at the victorious word. By doing what? Triumphing over them. How? Very, very important, very important, very important. I like verse 15 because sticking with my allergy, my analogy, Jesus went into their locker room and took all their equipment. <laughs> so they showed up on the field with no cleats, <laughs> no helmets, <laughs> no shoulder pads. <laughs> Come on, y'all not getting this. No playbook. <laughs> I want you to get this. And we're afraid of a team like that? <laughs> Let's walk this out. Verse 11. In him. Come on, say in Christ. And I'm going to move quick. Come on and say in Christ. I was circumcised with a circumcision made without hands now listen listen putting off the body of flesh and look at what it says now by the circumcision of christ let me read it one more time then i'm going to summarize having been buried with him in baptism in which we were raised with him through faith through faith this is not a literal thing in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead and you who were dead in your trespass and uns the uncircumcision of your flesh God made alive together with him and then I like this verse having forgiven all of our trespass and then I like the phrase that says he canceled the what the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demand if there's nothing else worth a shout Verse 14 is worth a shot right there. Because I know I've done some things. Come on, don't act like you hadn't done. I know I have. I, come on, come on. Are you, are you, too many holy folk up in here. I know I have done some things. Come on, come on. And then, and then the text says, the text says, the text says that now based on the position that I have in Christ, when he looks at me, that doesn't count no more. He cancels it, and in the mind of God, as if it never, I wish I had somebody in here, I have imputed righteousness. He sees his blood on my life. He doesn't see what I was, but he sees who I have become in him. I know I have done some things, and he has canceled the debt. Come on, say amen if that's you this morning. I want y'all to hear me. I know I have done some things. Maybe you're still ashamed of what you did, but what canceling says that he doesn't remember it anymore. He just sees me. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Canceling says when he sees me, he sees his blood-washed child. That's good news. Let me help y'all understand what's going on. Sit down for a while. I'm almost done. Give me a few minutes. Say circumcision, circumcision, say baptism, baptism. and say resurrection. resurrection. Okay, good. Let me talk about those two, three things real quick. In the Old Testament, in Genesis 17, um, God established a covenant with Abraham. And he said to Abraham, every male that's in your house, whether you bought them, whether they were born there, however they got to your house, for them to enter into covenantal relationship with me, and share in the benefits that I have for you, I want you to circumcise the foreskin of their flesh, okay? So circumcision then was the mark of a covenantal relationship with God. Here's the important thing that you need to know about circumcision. Circumcision is a cutting away of the flesh. It's a cutting away of the flesh, okay? And so, Old Testament, anybody who joined the Israelite clan, they were circumcised to symbolize that they removed the flesh to be a part of the covenantal relationship with God. That was law. Ephesians, I think, says, for by grace are we saved through faith. It's a gift, not works, so no man could boast. New Testament, here is how circumcision looks like in the New Testament. 
I come to Christ and I identify, listen to this carefully, with the cutting away of the flesh that Christ did, so I am circumcised in Christ. I know that's confusing. Let me explain. Malik, thank you for doing this. I think I texted Malik a few minutes before service and said, I need this cross, and he went above and beyond and got it done for me. I want you to look at this cross, and I don't want you to see the cross empty. I want you to see Jesus hanging on the cross. Are you with me? And the reason I want you to see Jesus hanging on the cross is I want you to see him hanging in bodily form on the cross. Are you with me? Everybody tracking with me? Okay. Now, before he went to the cross, we know the story quite well. He was beaten. He was mutilated. He was pierced in the side. All that stuff happened. And then while on the cross, he uttered these seven last words. And then one of the words that he uttered prior to his death, I believe it was word number six, Father, into thy hand, I commend my what? And then the seventh word said, I think he hung his head and he died and he said, yeah, telestei is the Greek word. It is finished or it is complete. Circumcision has taken place. He's hanging on this cross, and on the cross, he has my sins. <laughs> he has yours, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> on the cross, he has the sin that anybody on the face of the earth is ever going to commit. Y'all not hearing me this morning. And he takes on so much sin that God could not look at his only son. So here's what he says, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Because it was at the instant in time prior to his death, he bore so much of the weight of the sins of the world in the flesh. I wish I had somebody in here. That his heavenly father had to turn his head away because he couldn't stand to see the present of his son hanging on that cross with all that sin. I want y'all to hear me. I want y'all to hear me. Then when everybody's sin was on him, here is what he said to the Satan, to the enemy. Start cutting. Start cutting. And when it got close to who he was, father... The circumcision is about to finish. So let me exit the flesh while the cutting away. Ah, I wish I had somebody in here. So he takes the spirit man and he hands it to God the Father and he leaves the uncircumcised. Oh, you got to get this. I don't want to be coarse. He leaves the foreskin hanging on the cross. I want y'all to hear me. So Paul says, he nailed it to the cross. What you have on the cross was the forgiveness of sin, the atonement for sin, sin itself. Now watch this. Dumb Satan. Celebrating. I got him. You just got foreskin. So he says, I put him to open shame. <laughs> he think he has me, but this isn't me. This is the sins of the world nailed to the, I wish I had somebody up in here. I am in my father's hand. Are you with me? Because, Father, into thy hand, I come, come on, come on, come on, I commend my spirit. So he put him to open shame, and Satan is celebrating, thinking he's got him. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. And those dumb Romans, following the law, takes him down, puts him in a tomb, and they buried him. And they're throwing a party. If I was Baptist, that's where a hoop would come in right there. They place him in a borrowed tomb. 
Uh, uh. <laughs> no, leave that alone. Yeah. Y'all know, y'all know the story, right? But, but they put him there. Then he got to say, but th- three, was it three days later? He got to say, early. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what they used to say, right? Then they get to say, ah, you know, they holler a little bit. It was, it was early Sunday morning. Y'all know the story quite well. But the point was they put him in the tomb. And then here's the thing. They killed and circumcised the flesh. They put the flesh in the tomb. Okay, God, send the spirit back. The spirit comes, re-enters the body, and Jesus emerges with the grave from the grave. Listen to how I'm going to say this. With a body that couldn't carry sin no more. You guys are tracking with me? I'm almost done. I'm almost done. I'm almost done. So here's how Paul says it. We are circumcised with him. We are buried with him in baptism. And then we are raised to newness. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of get it. You kind of get it. You kind of get it. You want, I want you all to get this. I want to get this. Now look at the last verse and then I'm going to start. I want to get this right. Verse 15. So it says now, because he got up from the grave, he disarmed the what? Rulers and what? Authorities. Authorities and he put them to what? Open shame. Open shame triumphing over them in him. So here's what this looks like. This is a trip. He comes out the grave. And Mary encounters him. And she had a relationship with him, just a good paternal relationship. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Eat, talk to the hand. (laughs) This ain't what it used to be. (laughs) Can't mess with this. I can't let you touch this because you still like that. <laughs> so, with this same body, check this out. He walks through walls. But then he gets hungry and he eats some fish with this new body. Okay? And then he tries to get us to understand in Corinthians if any man is in Christ, he is a new, the Greek word, tissus. A new creation. The old has gone. And the new has come. And then it says, he disarmed the rulers and the authority. Let me summarize now. So don't let nobody catch you with vain philosophies or elemental spirits of the world. Let me tell you what that means. With this new body, if you really track it, and I'm walking in the spirit so I don't fulfill the desires of the flesh... Satan has no authority over this. The new body. Don't don't fool yourself into thinking I'm talking flesh now. I'm talking to spirit man. Are you with me? He has no authority over this. So when Satan comes, I just got to say, eek. Then you add, I got your equipment out of your locker room. I want you to understand this. So if you want to fight, bring it on, because I've already won. Come on, y'all. Because you lost, and you stopped at sin on the cross. Post-cross, you have no access. I want y'all to see. Does this make sense, guys? So when I come to Christ, here's how it says it. I think it's verse 9. In Christ, the full deity of God dwells. So that means when I look at Jesus, I see all of God in him. I just need to get in Christ, and I need to stay in Christ and let Christ do all the fighting. (laughs) Does this make sense, guys? The old me was nailed to the cross. The new me, come on, worship team, has been raised victoriously. Come on, does this make sense, guys? I want y'all to lock into this. Quit focusing on what the enemy is trying to do to you. 
Here's why I'm saying this. You have his playbook. You got into his equipment room. Okay, now I'm going to say something crazy real quick. I'm going to say something really, really crazy. You have all his equipment, and, and, and you, by virtue of the fact that Christ defied the grave, you've already won. Now, if he's on you like that, maybe you're not in Christ. Let's just be honest about it. Because I'm trying to tell you this. I said this a few weeks ago. Now let me say it this way. No man can go into a strong man's house and capture him unless he first binds the strong man. And last I checked, let me go grandma, last I checked, <laughs> there's nobody coming up in the house of God to take one of God's. I wish I had somebody up in here. That's if you're in Christ. That's if you're in Christ. Come on, are you, is this making sense? And I don't need to cite Job to give you an illustration of what I'm talking about. Very, very important for us to understand what happened on Calvary. So when we get in the game, the reason I wanted to read that email, you're not playing from a position of fear. You're playing from a position of victory. So you're looking at the crazy guy, and I've done this with missions team that will go into the heart of Haiti to the most literal, real sense of the word, demons, voodoo, working, infested places, and don't have a care in the world. Are you hearing me? Because I know who I am in Christ. And I know the enemy can't access me like that. He can tempt me all he wants. If I keep ignoring him, he will eventually go away. It's when I stop and engage him in conversation. Come on, does this make sense, guys? You are fighting from a position of victory. You are already victorious in Christ. I want you all to hear me say this over and over and over again. I want you to hear me. Greater is he that is in you than he that is where? Okay? Now, next week, we're going to talk about how to live this life because a lot of us are so concerned about the law and all this legal stuff that we've sacrificed our freedom. But, baby, you're free in Christ. Are you hearing me? So here's me. Give me A flat real quick. I have a different respect for the cross. Are you with me? I have a different respect at it. So I can appreciate grandma and them back in the day, right? They look at it, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. And the burdens of my heart roll away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I am happy all Y'all know that, right? Hey, now you know, down at the cross where my Savior died. Down where from cleansing from sin I cried. There to the cross was the blood of God. Everybody come on, say glory. Glory. 